Okay. Hi, Penelope. How are you? I'm fine, Douglas. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you for coming on the show. It's nice to have you here. So reading through your bio, it says that you were born and educated in England. You now live in New York. How long have you been in New York? Um, over 30 years now. Okay, because yes. I, I barely detect a British accent. I it's think... there when I call home. You know, you code <laughs> switch and you go back. So I went from, I went to university in York and I went from old York, which is 2000 years old, to New York, which is 250 years old. Um, so it was, it was quite a move. But you decided to stay in New York, yeah? Well, I met a man. Oh, there you go. Okay. And then you have children in the right. I always plan to go back home. But once you have children who are Americans and you're, you know, their lives are here, then it's just about visiting, you know. But I, I do love to go back. Okay. Also says that you're a novelist, a playwright, business writer, marketing executive. Yes. Um, yeah. I started writing in college. I studied literature and linguistics and wanted to be a creative uh, writer. And, uh, you know, being a, a star novelist can sometimes have the, the odds of being a star NBA player. Um, but I got into business writing because and book writing, business book writing and, and ghost writing, co-authoring, because if you want to write, then you have to write every day. Uh, you need the discipline. So I needed to be in a job. Uh, where I could do that. And then as my family grew, I really did go back to creative writing, to, to writing novels. Um, and I really enjoy that. How many books do you have published at this point? Well, I've written or co-written a lot of business books. So I probably have six or seven of those. Um, I co-wrote um, the story of the Harlem Gospel Choir with um, its founder. Alan Bailey, which was a great book because it's kind of a view into the civil rights mu uh, movement. Alan was part of the civil rights movement in in Harlem. And then, of course, on Martin Luther King Day, uh, you know, they, they fought very hard to uh, establish uh, Martin Luther King Day. So it's sort of the story of that whole civil rights movement and the Harlem Gospel Choir. And um, Alan Bailey was fascinating. He was involved in show business. He did the, for those people who remember, uh, the Rumble in the Jungle with Muhammad Ali and George, um, who was the other boxer, Douglas? George Foreman. Uh, George Foreman, yeah, out in Zaire. Uh, he was friends with Ali, went to the uh, training camp. He escorted Nina Simone. He knew Miles Davis. I really loved working. We used to record, you know, he'd walk down memory lane and uh, he was, you know, he uh, worked with the Commodores, Michael Jackson, the Jackson Five. He toured with them. So it was just, uh, you know, it was really a great uh, sitting and recording and listening to him uh, speak about those consequential times. So I, I wrote that and then I wrote a book called The Apple, which was based on the Herman Rosenblatt Holocaust story. So Herman uh, Rosenblatt got into hot water when he was a genuine um, Holocaust survivor. He and his four brothers had been through several camps. Uh, he was only a child, uh, second grade, uh, when the war broke out. But then he fabricated, he did a New York Post competition on Valentine's Day and he fabricated this love story and said that his wife, when she was a child, had thrown him apples into the concentration camp and uh, and then he met her years later when they both emigrated to New York, Brooklyn. And of course, this got him a lot of attention and he wound up on the Oprah Winfrey show and Oprah said it was the greatest love story ever told. Well, that attracted the attention of all of the um, of all of the, you know, Holocaust historians and sort of cult culture. And they proved beyond a reasonable doubt that, you know, it was that piece of the story was fabricated, that there was no way that this little girl could have tossed him apples over the fence of the concentration camp. So. He, it was sort of debunked and he was came in for a lot of, you know, criticism um, because the, the problem was that he had represented it as a true bi biography. If he had based it on a real, you know, if he had based it on his life story, but allowed that there was this fiction in it. So because it involved Oprah, and I think it was the second time that she had had a, an author on that had sort of um, bent the truth, shall we say. Uh, there was a lot of consternation. It was a big cause celeb. And I was approached to write the book about 
the story behind the story. So basically his true Holocaust account and then how he got into fabricating the story and the whole Oprah episode and what happened to him. And so I worked on that. Um, and that was a difficult project because I had to research the Holocaust very quickly, which was difficult. And then there was a lot of controversy and anger around uh, Herman's story. But so anyway, I did that. And uh, but this new novel is it's sort of like the Da Vinci Code. Code. It's a it's a good uh, fast paced thriller scavenger hunt. It it deals with fringe uh, sort of religious uh, uh, religious claims. Uh, like Jesus in India and the chalice, uh, the Holy Grain be being taken to Glastonbury and buried under Glastonbury Tor with the blood of Christ in it. So there's, it's a sort of spiritual, it's metaphysical, and but it's 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 digestible. It's got romance in there. So I think it's it's a crossover, crossover book, and I really enjoyed writing that. It was much easier than much less wear and tear than uh, working on the apple. Um, is the Angel Scroll a real thing, like the Dead Sea Scrolls? Yeah, well, the original uh, Dead Sea Scrolls <clears throat> were discovered in 1946, I believe, around what is now the West Bank uh, region. Uh, thousands and thousands of you know pieces of um, parchment on parchment and copper and animal, and they were kept in jars and they were found and they you know, they gave a lot of insight into uh, uh, early, th I think, three century BC, um, Jewish faith, law, mosaic law, uh, the early Bible, early the early books of the Bible. And they were all, you know, they, that was the find of the century. I mean, that was such a troll for historians. Then in the 90s, uh, uh, another scroll was supposed to have been found called the Angel Scroll. This was found on, allegedly, on the Jordanian side of the Dead Sea in caves there. And it was written up in the Jerusalem Post and in AP and various news outlets. And scholars had seen uh, drawings of it. And it was supposed to, it was written by Yeshua the priest. Of course, Yeshua is Hebrew for, for Jesus. Um, and people really thought it was real. It was, had a lot of angelic imagery in it. It uh, talked about a tour of heaven. It talked about an ap apocalyptic end with suns around Jerusalem. And so people pursued it as though it was real, but this then as time went by into the 2000s, because they really couldn't pin it down, they really didn't get to see it in person. They were just, it was hearsay and drawings of it. They sort of came to the conclusion that it may have been a hoax. So the angel scroll or the scroll of the angel um, was allegedly a real scroll, um, but it's, it's, it's sort of, they're just not willing to say that anymore. But I read it and I was I was absolutely fascinated by it because I thought it was fantastic that another big find in that um, arena had been uh, discovered. And I thought, oh, that'd be a great kicking off point for, uh, for a novel. If What if the, the Angel Scroll has a 21st century prophecy in it? Uh, it's predicting a new gospel, but this time the gospel is not written. It is it comes in the form of three divine paintings that are created by their healing and they're created by amateur artists because they're channeled. And when you put them together, fantastic things happen. And so that's the basis of the scavenger hunt to go looking for these paintings, this race against time, see if they can be tracked down and, and then to find out what happens when you put these three paintings together. Is the prophecy real? Are miracle, do miracles really happen or is it, or is it just a, um, a myth. Is this similar to Raiders of the Lost Ark in its style? Yeah, yeah I think any time, you know, that was the, the, you know, there's a lot of mythology around the, the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, you know, modern day uh, UFO followers believe that it's some kind of energetic nuclear device that it radiates, that it's toxic if you get too close to it. So yeah, it's very much a very ancient, mystical, compelling supernatural artifact that you know you know is a bridge back to uh you know pre-biblical to biblical times or pre-christian times and you know what happens uh, it's lost you know go looking for it um similarly with the um you know the grail quest the arthurian legend the great grail quest the King Arthur grew up around Glastonbury Tory, was a real king, um, and he, his knights went looking for the, the chalice that had uh, been used at the Last Supper. 
<clears throat> they believed it was buried there and they believed that it was life renewing. That it was this miraculous artifact. If they could find it, they'd have the secret to renewed life. So it's along that same vein. It's except these are these paintings are not they're being created by modern artists um, according to prophecy. So they're being um, they're they're not ancient and being discovered. They're actually being created by three three unknown artists, and that's one of the reasons in the book that you know that they're miraculous because they are the quality of an old master. But they're one of them is painted by a car mechanic in France. He literally picks up a brush one day and he starts painting this masterpiece. You had mentioned before we got on that the book was being considered for a film adaptation. Yes, some people read the novel and said. I think because I started life as a playwright, so I think in terms of drama and scenes, um, much more than, you know, a, 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 more of a trained novelist, the narrative style. So when I wrote the book, it was very, it's almost a series of scenes. So I think when people read it, they, they think, oh, wow, this is, it's like a movie. I can see it in my head playing like a movie. So some people have read it and approached me and said, would you work with someone to turn it into a script? A movie script, but of course you know. I'm sure you know, Douglas, that everybody's chasing, uh, a, you know, scripts and movies, and and it's uh, you know a small percentage that breaks through. But <clears throat> it is a, it's a very good story. It takes place in sacred places. Um, it kicks off in Manhattan, at the center of the art world, and it follows to Israel, to England, Glastonbury Tor, very sacred places in Israel and England, and then Europe. So they go to France, they go to Italy, they go to Siena, um, the great cathedral, the dome of St. Catherine in Siena. So it's a little like the Da Vinci Code and it's, it's going to these religious um, uh, mystical places. So from that perspective, it's got a, an international it's got an international theme and I know that films now they're always looking to extend the audience base by, you know, making more uh, international and of interest to different countries. Well, so it, it doesn't we'll see about that. It doesn't sound like it would be a low budget. This would be a big if you're going to actually travel to all those places, you're going to be up in yeah. the James Bond sort of budget. <laughs> that that yeah. somebody to bring that point. I mean, I think there's a way to do it. I mean, not everything is an exterior scene. You know, you could certainly create something that looked like saying, you know, the inside of a room in St. St. Paul's Basilica. Well, it could be um, so AI. You, you could, could be, get more shade. You yeah. know, the, a lot of the action is not actually taking, it's taking in place in, inside rooms. It's not an action scene through the streets of Rome or anything. But you're making a good point. It's, it's, uh, someone's got to figure out how to do that in a cost effective way if they want to do it. In your imagination, you can go anywhere, right? Well, and, and the sky's the limit with the budget. Because if you want to actually go to these places, you've got to bring the whole crew with you and uh, you know you're already in the millions of dollars for that so although the CGI stuff is becoming so I, I getting, don't know if you I followed the crown yeah on uh, Netflix because obviously I'm English and <clears throat> I have a great fondness for Her Majesty the Queen who sadly passed away we used to call her granny we always referred to her as granny um, and in making the crown, I think they, I know that they filmed in some very impressive um, stately homes, but I do think they created some of those interiors with CGI. So it's pretty amazing what they can, you know, what, what they can do with the computer generated stuff. So we, you know, maybe we could have a computer generated Rome and Israel and. Yeah, yeah, that's quite possible. Uh, we've got just about a minute and there was one of your books that I just wanted to bring up quickly because I got a kick out of the title, I laughed. It said, Emotional Intelligence at Work. Now, yeah. <laughs> is, is the title alluding to what I think it is, that people just need to control themselves and, and not get so hysterically emotional when they go to work? Oh, wouldn't, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> yes, partly. <laughs> Basically, the premise of the book, and listen, there are a lot of psycho, uh, psych, psychologists that debunk emotional intelligence. You know, Coleman, Dan Col Col Coleman wrote, the book Emotional Intelligence. And, you know, whether you want to make it a, a, a measurable science or not, we all know people who are diplomatic. They know how to manage people. They know how to restrain themselves. Um, but the book, the premise of the book is people in business think that business runs on facts and reason and, and rationality. 
and it doesn't. It, it's it's driven by emotional agendas. Um, people will put their ego needs before profit. That's why you see executives making crazy decisions. You think who in their right mind would would make a decision like that? You see it happening all the time. And the reason is, is because motion, emotions control people. If you don't learn to control your emotions, your emotions will control you. And they will, you know, they will, um, everybody's had the petty tyrant boss or the, you know, the difficult employee. Or, and I think people just, they go into a meeting and there's a set agenda, a business agenda. And in the book we say, look around the room and see if you can discern, everyone's got a personal agenda. This one wants credit. For something this one is mad because someone stole their idea this one is you know everybody's got an emotional agenda and if you're smart you will you know you'll give some thought to that and not just run on this premise that oh no it's all just you know knowledge based and iq based and you can have a very high iq and be sort of emotionally stunted so uh, I... it's probably better <laughs> to have a, 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 a to not be emotionally stunted and have a, an average iq you know you're probably going to go further I know a few people like that. Uh, we do have to wind this down. Unfortunately, we are out of time. So the book is called The Angel Scroll. Has it been released? Yes, it came out at the end of uh, 28th of June. And it's uh, by, uh, published by Collective Inc, who is both in the US and the UK. And so you can get it anywhere, as they say, anywhere books are sold. Um, Barnes and Noble, Amazon. Um, bookstores don't, you know, you've sometimes got to order uh, for to be put on the shelf. But yes, you can find it anywhere that you can order a book. OK, last question. Do you have a website you want to give out? I do. Um, if people go to PenelopeHolt.com, PenelopeHolt.com, they can see the book trailer. And I'm, I'm actually starting to blog about some of the um, interesting places and and uh, myths and allegories and religious, you know, little known religious facts that I fell across when I was doing my research for the book. So head on over there if you're interested in a quick read. OK. Well, Penelope, thanks so much for coming on the show. It was nice meeting you and chatting with you. And uh, best of luck with the book. I hope it does well. I'd like to see it as a film, I hope. Yeah, I'll ping you if it gets done. And uh, <laughs> I'll, 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 th I'll start thinking about how to keep the budget down if, if we ever get, that, get to that point. So thank you very much, Douglas. Thanks for having me on.